Good day, everyone, wherever you are, in uh, Moscow, in Abu Dhabi, in uh, Egypt, in Cairo, in London, and I am in Beirut, Raghida Darham. I am the founder and executive chairman of Beirut Institute, and we are doing these wonderful e-policy circles with magnificent talent in the international policy-making arena. And I am very proud to have with us today uh, His Excellency Amru Musa, uh, His Excellency Alistair Burt, and we have, of course, uh, that Admiral Bob Harward and Vitaly Nankin, and I am, uh, of course, discussing with them the same theme that we have all the time, which is stability redefined, and that is the theme of Beirut Institute Summit in Abu Dhabi that we had to postpone because of the COVID-19. It was supposed to be held June the 13 and 14. Unfortunately, edition four was unable to be uh, convened uh, on time. However, it will be convened, God willing, inshallah, uh, in uh, 2021, in March 13 and 14. Welcome, everyone. We will have exactly one hour. We will discuss uh, stability redefined from geopolitical uh, point of view of uh, the difference from one person to another, obviously. But also, we're not going to forget what it does to people, to the young people, to the future yeah. jobs. We're going to jam in as much as possible. So I will start uh, with His Excellency Amr Musa because he is the senior person amongst all of us. And uh, I'd like to uh, give you three minutes, like I would, uh, three, four minutes maximum, like I will give everyone to lay the grounds of what you want us to hear from you. And I expect that you would want to speak about Egypt, North Africa, and the Arab region. So the floor is yours. Please go ahead. You've got four minutes at most, and then you have a lot of time to go back and forth with this great panel. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, time's short. That's why I will uh, just mention three things. Number one, the, on the international scene, the stability redefined uh, will have to do with the performance of the multilateral system. Uh, and I do agree with what the Secretary General of the UN has uh, affirmed one, more than once, that the threats to international peace and security will have to be redefined. The Security Council will have to seize the opportunity and uh, act within the framework of uh, uh, our action against pandemics. Uh, even if this requires a certain amendment, either to the Charter or the, to the procedures of the Security Council, this is important, a redefinition of the threats to international peace and security. Second point on the international uh, uh, scene, I believe that we have to think of something like, not exactly the same, like the old non-alignment, but without uh, its mistakes and its composition. Uh, now we are on the, on the verge of another uh, Cold War, uh, model uh, 21st century, uh, between the US, United States, and China. And this requires a group of countries, responsible countries, that would do everything possible to prevent this Cold War to go uh, 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 anywhere else uh, in, in terms of confrontation, uh, international confrontation that do threats uh, uh, international peace and security. On the regional scene, I believe that what we have seen is lack of coordination. Uh, although countries are, uh, they have a lot of movement of citizens, and uh, uh, therefore, I believe that the region, the MENA, MENA region and around it, do need a, a, a health agency, not the, like the, a regional agency for health, a regional agency on the matters of uh, pandemics and how to coordinate and how to promote the uh, resistance to such pandemics that scientists do say, do affirm that it, is, it will be recurrent and even corona itself would repeat, would come back and some other pandemics. So we have to be ready on the regional level, not only country by country. That's why a, health age, a regional health agency, MENA health agency would be uh, uh, very much in order. 
Third point is about Egypt. I think, like all other citizens, that the government is doing uh, a good job. The, uh, the, the, uh, until now, the debt uh, list does not exceed 500 something. The, uh, there is a kind of commitment by citizens to uh, the restrictions and confinement and stay home, etc. Uh, here, I, I must say that there is something, uh, something special in the developing nations and in, in Egypt in particular, that uh, the, the uh, educated class, uh, all of them uh, do say, yes, sir, we'll do whatever the government is saying. But in the middle class, say in the lower middle class and going down, uh, people have another philosophy that uh, whatever we do when the uh, age comes to an end, it will be, uh, it will come to an end. It is not a question of you know, stay home or stay in the street. When you come to die, you will die. So there is a, a, come some philosophical, you can say religious, but it is a state of mind. Therefore, while the government is doing whatever it can in order to uh, uh, deal with this issue, uh, like all other uh, governments, all other uh, states, but we have a certain philosophy in our society, especially in villages, in the rural areas, that would make it difficult indeed uh, for all of us to be sure that everything is in, in order uh, yeah. and within the, the, the a, a, a restricted uh, uh, framework. Yeah, let me follow up with a quick question about the government of Egypt. Uh, are you uh, in suggesting that this government is doing the right thing uh, on the coronavirus? Uh, but uh, what about the government, the nation of the government of Egypt right now? Is this uh, a, a way of uh, keeping Egypt on the road of stability? Is stability redefined in Egypt through the current government versus uh, maybe what would have been there, say, the Muslim Brotherhood? We are in a special position, even geographical position, to our West Libya with all the problems in Libya and the presence of militias, foreign militias, etc. And to our right, and especially in the mountains of Sinai, you will find some of those uh, terrorists coming uh, and performing still. Uh, the, the environment, the regional environment, is so dangerous. That is why a stable government, a, a, a powerful government, strong government is needed, is needed. We have to decide the priorities. Our priority is to maintain stability in Egypt. And stability in Egypt in such a regional environment needs this strong government. So I believe that it is not the moment, it is not the time to discuss this issue, but we'll have to be uh, absolutely vigilant about the future and the future uh, has its uh, 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 needs and requirements. We will come to that. But now, yes, indeed, my answer is yes, we need this government and the government is doing fine. Uh, as you know, you are also the daughter of the same environment like me. We know how things are, and it is better to maintain stability rather than to enter into some philosophical discussions like the, uh, the your question uh, recommends. Um, and, all right, thank you. We will be getting into the issue of Libya and North Africa altogether with the recent developments in Tunisia. In may, may I ask you, and in, in particular, Vitali, to discuss the issue of another a group of countries like the non-alignment in the old century, in the past century, to deal with that, okay. Thank we will in the, in the q and I mean, not q and in the in, uh, in exchange amongst you. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of Q&A, uh, I do want to remind uh, our distinguished uh, listeners that uh, I will be taking questions, written questions, but because it's one hour and very short and very sharp, I will benefit from your wisdom, but I, it's not going to be interventions, live interventions. So maybe in the future, if we make it two hours, then there will be one, but uh, your presence is uh, much, much, much appreciated. Um, Alistair Bird, uh, let me take you to Europe and your agonies in Europe. Uh, how, uh, uh, how does the threat of instability uh, affect your calculations? Is this something that you feel, uh, you know, this too shall pass, that yeah, the COVID-19 will leave you tucked in safely? Or uh, do you, is there a need for uh, stability redefined in the UK and Europe? And go ahead, use this 
as a way to say whatever you wanted to say. I just wanted to uh, segue into, into giving you the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Regida, and thank you for the opportunity to speak at uh, this event. Um, and indeed, I do want to talk a little bit about Europe. Uh, I've picked three areas that have a relationship with stability one way or another uh, to cover in just uh, three or four minutes uh, and then come to a, a, a short conclusion. Uh, first, the Europe. This crisis has come at a bad time for Europe. It was already reeling under the problems of the financial crisis of some years ago and the impact on Greece with the Eurozone in trouble. Uh, then we had the immigration crisis that uh, uh, did such damage to Mrs Merkel a couple of years ago. That's not gone away. Uh, there are pressures on Europe now with uh, issues relating to authoritarianism in the Eastern Bloc countries as they've taken advantage of COVID-19 to make some changes to their laws. And of course, Brexit and the, the threat to the stability of Europe. So this crisis has come at a bad time. And if stability is to be regrained, and Europe has been a beacon of stability since, the, uh, since 1945, then it's got to find a way out of this and it's going to need real leadership. Uh, so that's one issue. A second issue when we're thinking about stability for the future would be the hope we have in our young people. But my goodness, they've been dealt a rough blow uh, as if 2008 and the financial crisis wasn't bad enough in the Western and developed world for young people. This is going to make it more difficult. We're anticipating unemployment going up uh, a great deal and young people's futures will be very different. We already have issues of anxiety and mental health in many societies. But if you move away from the UK, what is the future for the uh, emerging populations in the Middle East and uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa? Many, many more young people, they need new jobs and they're going to be coming of age at a time when their economies are badly hit and we're all trying to struggle with dealing with the debt. So that's a crisis. On another tag about young people, the New York Times had a fascinating article the other day about young people in China and how they have been affected by the crisis and beginning to be much more questioning of their state and their government than they have been in the past because of what's happening. Is there a, a light awakening for a different form of uh, politics in China as a result of this. My third comment about stability is about the Middle East, not noted for stability, and of course looking for a way out of all the crises in the past. Has the crisis uh, given them the chance to look again at their old problems? As the UN Secretary General asked, he asked for a global ceasefire. No sign of it in the Middle East. Libya goes on, Syria goes on, Yemen, there may be a prospect, and what about the future for Israel and the West Bank and Gaza uh, with the prospects for annexation? So is the Middle East taking any opportunity whatsoever to stabilize as in the past or is, are things going to get worse? My conclusion is firstly, it's much too early to talk about where stability will be after the tectonic plates are shifted. But my guess would be we're not heading towards a brave new world. The world will be pretty much as it is. Will we have, however, have retreated away from any multilateral sense whatsoever into greater nationalism. And if we do, if that's a, if, if that's a recipe for stability, then I'm Moby Dick. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much. And I'm really grateful and appreciative of the fact that you brought in the young people because it really breaks our hearts that they are suffering so very much with the anxiety, with the feeling of instability was, uh, and, and you mentioned in Europe, never mind what's happening in the Middle East and, 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 and the Arab region in particular, I don't know what we can do to deal with this issue of unemployment, uh, the issue of anxiety, the issue of well-being. And I hope that we can have a discussion about that when we engage uh, collectively uh, further. I will give the floor now to Vitaly Naumkin. Vitaly Naumkin, I think it, Russia normally has its own definition of stability. Uh, you are always emphasizing the word stability, but my understanding of your use of the word is more of stabilization rather than stability. Do correct me if I'm wrong. Do tell me kindly, uh, how do you uh, see stability redefined in light of what's going on from the COVID-19 to the oil crisis? And I'm sorry that you are going through a difficult time in Russia because of COVID-19. And, and of course, everywhere in the world, in the US and in, uh, in, in the UK. But do share with us your feeling uh, whether stability needs to be redefined from your point of view 
and where are the major points of concern for stability uh, for Russian interests regionally and internationally right. and internally. Thank you, Ravida. I think <clears throat> that uh, I have some doubts about whether stability should be redefined or not. I think there are a lot of uh, uh, important, a lot of uh, importance and uh, roles played by all these old uh, traditional standards. But uh, stability is very shaky now in this age of, <clears throat> sorry, coronavirus. It's highlighted by coronavirus. The old uh, dichotomies are there, like stability versus, uh, I don't know, versus uh, probably freedoms or cooperation and openness, which is needed now against uh, versus nationalism, protectionism, isolationism. We see that all. Uh, economic, uh, 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 the economic uh, problems like unemployment, uh, already has been mentioned here, but we can see that uh, one of the uh, so consequences of this, uh, of coronavirus is uh, inevitably stagflation because of the limitations uh, for people's communication and the curtailment of uh, manufacturing activities. There is a general uh, shift in the distribution of uh, resources towards medical care and inside medical care towards uh, treatment of uh, uh, infection of coronavirus. We are facing it here. Uh, the United States is facing the same. Uh, we can see the also recession in, uh, in, in, uh, in the economic activities. And it means that there will be a lot of uh, social and uh, economic problems, uh, not only unemployment, but also lack of uh, activities, uh, damage inflicted on the on uh, small businesses and uh, it will continue because we never know some people believe that we, we should think that even in the name of your uh, this seminar uh, we're speaking about uh, no uh, no coronavirus or no pandemia uh, future or with pandemia future probably it's a, a with pandemia or a with coronavirus uh, future we don't know to what extent we are going to face uh, the same uh, threats of course, we all need uh, <coughs> sorry cooperation, but sometimes it's under uh, severe challenges. Uh, coming to the Middle East, I totally agree uh, with Alistair about uh, uh, especially the Palestinian, the importance of the Palestinian problem is if uh, Mr. Netanyahu uh, uh, goes on with the forward with the plans for annexation, I think it will be a total disaster spreading to the region where we already uh, have a lot of new challenges to the regional conflicts. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we are more or less optimistic about the importance, the possibilities to solve what's happening uh, in this regional uh, conflicts, wars in Libya, Yemen, Syria, everywhere. So I think that also demonization of certain uh, states, including uh, Iran and probably But then uh, going with the uh, revisionist uh, plans uh, and so on. But uh, still, I think uh, there are a lot of these dichotomies, as I said. And uh, in the era of coronavirus, we have uh, to be together and probably to find the compromises and solutions yeah. for all these I, I, There's a lot to follow up with you on, uh, uh, because you did mention the crisis and demoralizing nations. I whether it is stabilizing or destabilizing, and definitely about the annexation issue, which I'm sure Amr Musa wants to come in uh, during the discussion on that. So let me just take these issues separately as we engage in a conversation and try to make this interactive. But in the meantime, I am going to go to Bob Harvard. Uh, defense is your background, uh, Admiral Harvard. And uh, uh, there are uh, many challenges in our part of the world that uh, got the American attention 
and got the involvement of the defense industry. You have your three, four minutes. Go ahead, and then we are going to have an exciting conversation about all of that. Well, thanks, Raghida. And I have to start because I want to talk about some of Alistair's comments, but I do see a striking resemblance between him and Moby Dick uh, to start with. But besides that, uh, we're talking about stability in, in a very uncertain time. And I describe it as two black swans flying into each other uh, during the perfect storm. You've got this COVID issue, which is, and I'll, I'll talk about the Middle East specifically this COVID issue, which is just overwhelming everyone, while at the same time we've seen this oil war or this realignment of oil resources. And both of those are challenging everyone, both financially, economically, and to the people that these governments are responsible for. And so in that period, when you think of this great nation competition, and at the same time, rogue nations with their nefarious activities have gone on a pause. So providing this sort of stability in conflict and uh, other activities while they deal internally to deal with this issues, the ones they're challenged by, to take care of their people and their economies. But the timing of that will be predicated on when they come out. So that's temporary stability allows these opportunities to reset. Or as Alistair talked about, is there the opportunity to reset and, and get these dialogues on? I think the dilemma for everyone is not knowing how long this will last and what the reset will look like economically, uh, financially, uh, the attitudes and approach of the people, many, as he said, are very young and challenged economically and just survival this way as well as the old. So I think that temporary pause and stability provides some opportunity. How we drive that for longer term real stability will be a challenge. And I'm also uh, noteworthy to see that the great nations, and I'm going to call great nations, all of them, are measuring themselves not only by how they're addressing their own internal problems, but the, how they can help externally and help others. And I think this is also really differentiating the nations here in this region and globally, uh, how that will be played out, how can, that can be leveraged and drive stability over the long run is, is to be determined. But I think the opportunity that presents itself to all of us. That's uh, very interesting that all of you are talking about initiatives for the future in light of uh, with this COVID-19 and its consequences. I, I heard Amr Musa speak of establishing uh, an Arab or a health agency for the whole Arab region. I hear you saying that you know, governments need to be looking into reforms that are necessary and be held responsible in a different way towards the citizens. Uh, and I want to, however, just follow up with you before I uh, moved into the regional issues uh, that I spoke about. I want uh, to ask you, Bob Howard, speaking of stability in the Gulf region where you live, you live in the UAE, uh, how do you read the American decision to withdraw the Patriot missiles from Saudi Arabia? We've heard that this was uh, from the Secretary of State that no, this is about reorganizing uh, uh, or redeployment of, the, of these missiles. Others said it's about something more important. It's a signal that things are going to be much better between the United States and Iran. So where do you stand on this uh, debate? And can you share with us what you know about the background of this decision and the importance of this decision? It's a reflection on the issue of stability in the region and the stability of the U.S. Uh, relationship with the Arab Gulf states. Again, I, I've heard various stories, but I can't uh, uh, verify the cause of this reallocation of assets. That's a continual process, be it patriots, be it ships, be it planes. There's always that dialogue with the host nations, the contributing nations who provide those assets to move them. Sometimes it's based on deployment lengths. Sometimes it's based on personnel availability. There's a host of reasons. But I think what's been steadfast in this situation and for the long haul is this commitment to the partnerships. 
and doing what is necessary to defend and protect our partners and our allies. That commitment is, is uh, unbounded and always has been, and I haven't seen that diminished at all. So the actual assets and resources and how they're allocated, where they move, or is predicated on a whole host of reasons. I did that for many years. I was part of that process. So to make a linkage from that to the actual threats, the partnership is really apples and oranges in some extent. So I would not read more into that. I would say the commitment is strong. The partnerships are even stronger. And I don't see anything that's going to be able to break those bonds. So you don't see, you don't read between the lines. There is any um, anything to it in terms of the relationship between the United States and Iran. No. No. Do you, uh, uh, Alistair Burt? I've seen um, I've seen no indication in the past few weeks that there's been any hand extended by one or the other. Uh, the United States made an offer of assistance in a manner that Iran wasn't able to accept. Iran kept up its provocations in the Gulf uh, and elsewhere during this period. Uh, we are yet to see what the situation will be in Iraq, where both the US and Iran believe that they have the ear of the new prime minister. But alas, no, the, the de-escalation de of tension between an Iran and the United States, which we might have seen because of the extent of the uh, coronavirus crisis hasn't been, hasn't been made. And that's because neither side has really been willing to make the sort of effort towards each other that would have made a difference. The question is at the end of this, will the situation simply go back to where it was or will it be deepened? Because this opportunity has been missed. The, the, the humanitarian crisis has been you know, very serious in Iran if it is only seen as an opportunity for more maximum pressure, will it push Iran further into a box and will Iran prove completely incapable of taking the decisions it needs to take in order to ease the pressure and always believe it is somebody else's fault? I, I wish I'd seen more progress between the US and Iran, um, but I don't think either has really wanted to do this. So you think we're still in the possibility in the realm of a confrontation? Yeah, I think we are, because if maximum pressure continues, the Iranian economy uh, is affected not just by what's been happening now. They've gone, they've put people back to work with what they call smart distancing because the economy is in such a difficult state. And of course, we've had a drop in the oil price and we are heading towards some form of confrontation in October on the uh, arms embargo clause as part of the JCPOA. So it's all building up towards some sort of confrontation and one side or another uh, has to make some move if this is going to be de-escalated. I don't see the confrontation situation being worse than it was a few weeks ago, but the opportunity to ease it on both sides wouldn't appear to have been taken. I'm going to go to you, Vitaly Naogli, but I first need to go to Amro Busa on this because I, I have more detailed questions for um, Vitaly Naogli on this issue, on the issue of Iran and the US and uh, the regional issues uh, that are the playground uh, for this relationship. But first, I want to go to Amr Musa and get his assessment on uh, the potential of US-Iranian uh, thaw or confrontation, and uh, in particular, how it's in light, uh, Amr Musa, of, of what's happened in Iraq. You know, you've been watching a new government that uh, uh, some have read between the lines that this is uh, and you know, sort of a uh, shake of a head between uh, the Iranians and the Americans, and that there is a new. Uh, page possibly being opened there towards more stability, hopefully, in Iraq. Do you read it the same way? And the same thing in Lebanon. Do you see any, just take these two examples of Lebanon and uh, Iraq uh, to tell me your view on the issue of US and Iranian relations, and then we get into Syria. After. Un until now, I don't see any serious indication that the situation between US and Iran will change. <laughs> Uh, or, but the potential is there, the possibility is there, especially uh, in light of what we have seen. Uh, the uh, American foreign policy can change direction at any time uh, according to uh, circumstances, new circumstances or something of that kind. Therefore, let us not exclude the possibility of a certain change in the, in the uh, uh, hated relations between the two countries 
to lessen that a little bit. But until now, we don't see that. Especially, we are in an election year in the U.S. Let us see if President uh, Trump is re-elected, then it could be more of the same with some changes here and there. If uh, a Democrat uh, is elected, perhaps there will be a change in the uh, a, a clear change uh, in the uh, U.S. position back to the uh, deal, the famous deal of the six uh, and the Iran. Uh, but the in conclusion, I just want to say that the potential is there. Let us not exclude a change in the uh, way the foreign policy, vis uh, American foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran would see some changes. So you too, like uh, last week, uh, Dr. Anwar Gargash, uh, the Minister of uh, State for Foreign Affairs of the United Arab Emirates, spoke of de-escalation. He emphasized the need for de-escalation. I hear you saying the same. No, no we are talking, not talking about the need, Paul. We need, of course, de-escalation, but we are talking about the actual situation. Are there signs that there is a change? No, there are no signs so far. Uh, but we cannot exclude the possibility of uh, them uh, happening. Yeah, you will never forgive me if I don't give you the floor now before I move on to tell me, because I heard two views from uh, Alistair Burt and from uh, Vitaly Nalkin about the Israeli annexation of the West Bank. I, wanna, I, I promise to give you the floor to say something about that, because I know you have something to say, and then I'll move on to the uh, other matters with Vitaly Nalkin. Please go ahead, Amr Musa. Okay, thank you. Of course, I agree with what they both have said. Annexation of the Palestinian territories, uh, the immediate annexation, and the way uh, Mr. Netanyahu is behaving, uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, give a very, very negative sign. And I once more wish to underline the importance of the public opinion in the Arab world, from east to west, from end to end. The Arab, the public opinion, the young people, the educated people will not accept such an annexation. Perhaps uh, our friends in the American foreign policy establishment would hear this or that uh, official uh, saying something uh, uh, much uh, quieter, etc. But the streets, universities, associations, and the, and the rest of the Arab societies, Muslim societies, and in fact in Europe too, all over, the, the, the a step to annex the, uh, the uh, territories will uh, raise, I don't want to say hell, but will raise a lot of uh, problems, uh, of uh, protests, uh, unacceptance mm. of such a move. The, the, it, it will render the whole deal, uh, what they call the deal of the century, uh, irrelevant because Israel has gotten 100% of what they wanted. Why should they negotiate? Why mm. should they give any, uh, uh, anything or, or, or to, to, to concede? This will put an end both to the deal of the century and to even the small signs of uh, 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 relations of uh, uh, some progress in the bilateral relations here and there. It will be very difficult. To Thank make you. those relations move on. Thank you. I'm going to go to you, Vitaly Nalkin, and I'm going to ask you whether you read in uh, uh, what's happening in Yemen, uh, because things are calmer, in Iraq, because there is a, a government that we thought that one would have thought that Iran would not have accepted, but now it's accepted. I don't know, in Syria, we are told that maybe there is a bit of, um, you know, uh, re regathering or pulling back a bit of the Iranians in Syria, Iranian troops or Iranian advisors or Iranian uh, militias, if you will. Uh, so what is, from your point of view, how do you look at the relationship between the United States and Iran? Are there signs of maybe a secret or you know, quiet conversation going on between them? Or is escalation still the most likely way that they will go? Give us your take. You are an expert on these relations and uh, I would like to know your take plus where Russia is on this. No, I don't think that uh, there are serious signs of uh, de-escalation. 
But uh, I think that the risks of serious confrontation or just a war or some military clash, um, it's uh, exaggerated. I think that uh, everybody is quite pragmatic, given that the Middle East has been already uh, destabilized even before coronavirus. Now there are two schools of thought, uh, even here <coughs> in Russia, that one is saying that coronavirus is helping uh, to calm down the situation in the region. Another school is saying, not on the contrary, it's exacerbating existing rivalries and conflicts because there is a uh, drop in oil prices and all these disasters in the economy. But there are not, not only the problem of Iran, don't forget about uh, what's happening with Turkey. Turkey, with so Qatar supporting one side in Libya, and uh, you know, <coughs> are supporting the other side, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Egypt, and uh, uh, you know the other side, and uh, the role of Saudi Arabia, uh, so the Muslim Brotherhood. So a lot of problems, a lot of problems. So the Middle East has been already destabilized, and stability is weaker. So we are all in favor of stability. You know, there was a Russian proposal uh, to start negotiations about the, some uh, collective security arrangements in the Middle East, inclusive arrangements. I've heard a lot of people it's saying It's uh, too early to say. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's way too early for that. We've heard even, again, back to last week's uh, e-policy circle. Uh, it's not time to do this. It's time to really take a look at what is more urgent because, you know, to discuss this sort of thing is not the time now. Uh, but however, I want to I do, I want to stop at what, uh, back again, to the role of Iran in Syria and the role of Russia in Syria. And do you, does, does Russia feel that the Iranian role right now is destabilizing what it's trying to do in Syria? You know, we, we care about our triangle, Russia, Turkey, Iran. Of course there are differences. Of course there are, there are different goals, and, uh, but at the same time we are all seeking stabil stability in this region. We're all seeking for helping uh, people not uh, squeezing them or... That, 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 we see that, that, that there are less violence there. There is less violence. But that's arguable. Other people will argue that it's just not at least what they see. So let's three, you know, try to really look at the situation to, to help people, to help Syria to be stable by doing an offensive in Idlib from the point of view of some is not really helping people, rather you know, it's killing people. So let us really try to, to be more on the realistic side with this and tell me where on earth do you see it going? There? Is there, what, are, what are the needed steps for, uh, to stabilize Syria for your interests or to stabilize your interests in Syria? And we know your relationship with Turkey is not at, in, its, in its best. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, you, you have problems with Turkey. So can we uh, sure. shed some light on the reality of these uh, relations? But still the process is there. The Astana process is there. It's still working, uh, despite all differences between the three sides, between the three so-called uh, state, uh, states uh, guarantors. So uh, in general, you know, don't forget that Russia is supporting uh, Security Council Resolution 2254. So working, we're working for that. We're supporting the revival of uh, uh, Geneva process. I, I have some hope that it can be done. So, but of course, in the uh, aftermath of uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, but uh, what else? What else? We're not uh, seeking anything but uh, stabilizing uh, Syria. And we're not seeking for any sort of domination or interest in the area. Uh, what we have, uh, we will keep, but uh, not more, not nothing, but uh, to, to uh, eliminate the last pockets of uh, the terrorist groups that have been attacking our base in Khmeimim and uh, anywhere else. Uh, so there should be some responses to that. I want, to, I want to take it to both Bob and to Alistair Burt on the issue of Turkey, then get back to you and uh, to Vitaly Nankin to tell me, because you mentioned Turkey. Look what's happening in Turkey, uh, by Turkey right now, in Libya, 
look what's going on uh, uh, in, as far as the accusation that uh, mercenaries are being taken from Syria to Libya, both from uh, the, via Turkish efforts and some uh, via uh, Russian efforts. And uh, the, uh, the, the madness of what's going on in Libya is a rather frightening situation, not only for the Libyans, apparently for the whole of North Africa and particularly for Tunisia. Let me get uh, Alistair Burt and uh, then I will take Bob's, uh, Bob Harwood's point of view and then I'll get back uh, to, uh, to you, Vitaly, and then to um, Hamra Musa. Let me give this a couple of minutes for uh, an, an, a more in-depth look at what's going on and where is it going to go uh, and what do you know about it, where, about where it's going to go. Alistair Burt? Yeah, um, uh, Libya suffers from all sorts of ills at the moment. Firstly, there's no uh, UN representative to replace Hassan Salami yet because there's been no agreement. It's, it's completely rudderless and into that situation of long-term confrontation between West and East which has made contact uh, in Libya very difficult, communities isolated, it's been very difficult to work up a political process, uh, as I understand. External powers have stepped in, uh, and with no other counterforce to Haftar's forces, Turkey, Turkey's intervention has made a significant difference. Um, I, I think there's a strong sense that unless the Libyan people are actually involved in making decisions about their own future, without external actors, will get nowhere. And that means a return to properly conducted negotiations, which the UN will have to supervise, and the engagement of nations not to put in forces on the ground, uh, but to work on the political compromise. The turn back on Haftar's forces in the last couple of days uh, has been met with some actions that have damaged hospital installations, water installations and the like. Uh, this is no good for the future of the Libyan people. It's already desperate. And as you indicated, uh, Ragida, the, the implications for neighbours are very serious. There's already a huge amount of arms in the area. We should all be worried about the Sahel, let alone Libya, and what's happening there as the next great push. So what Libya needs at the moment is external powers not to be backing armed forces, but to be backing the negotiations. There needs to be an agreement on a new UN representative, and ultimately it's the Libyan people who've got to decide, and the political process has got to involve them more than it has done up to now. With all due respect, easier said than done, plus the interference is absolutely, you know, uh, entrenched. So it's really not possible to say, oh, get the Libyans to just do the same. No, no, I, no, I, underst I understand that very well. But, but of course, you, but you've got to have some sort of plan somewhere. If you don't, then you are just leaving it to external forces and, and they'll fight until the last Libyan. And, and where's, the, where's the future in that? I mean, the whole point of having a political process and seeking to negotiate is to say, ultimately, there can be no military success uh, in Libya. Uh, Haftar's forces will never be allowed to take Tripoli without the loss of massive amounts of blood. And there's no stability after that. So if you know there's no end of the process where the military will win one way or another, mm. it's only the political solution that has got to happen. And that's where the, the UN process has got to be rekindled after all Hassan Salame's really strong efforts. But, uh, Bob Harward, uh, do you see uh, any light in the end of the tunnel for Libya? No. Uh, no. Um, that was absolutely not. I think that, Alistair said exactly right. In fact, I might add on to that. Well, start over. Start with your answer, please. So no, I don't see any light at the end of the table, tape, uh, tunnel. Unfortunately, it, what was ungoverned space has become governed by external forces that don't have the, the right alignment with the political process or the people who have to make that political process come to bear. So I don't know how you align those or enable those, and it's exacerbated by now the, ec the economic situation, COVID-19, and all those, not only internally, but externally, and influence that. So it's, it's taken a bad situation and made it even worse. So no, I, don't, I can't see any light. We're in a very dark tunnel. What about uh, if you compare Turkey's role, uh, and particularly he, he actually, uh, uh, President Erdogan got in because he says he was invited 
by Mr. Sarraj. So uh, where do you get out of this one? How do you do it? Um, the country is deeply divided. What, what is, if we were to imagine stability in Libya um, and that Tunisia, and uh, who's got to do what and give it a priority at this point? Who must do what? Well, well, let me just say this. The real tragedy is so many have an interest and it affects so many in not only North Africa, but the rest of the Arab world. Uh, so there's interest, uh, there's strategic interest by all of them. And yet, because of this split and because of the actors, we can't align those. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's a real quagmire. Yeah, it sure is a quagmire, Amru Musa. Quagmire at your borders, in your left, uh, I mean, in, in your back garden. Uh, Absolutely. How Absolutely, I. Uh, it is very important what has been said about the that we are going through a very dark period, very dark tunnel, with no end uh, in sight. But I have a question, a very simple question. Uh, was it a decision by Mr. Ortogan to uh, go to Libya and to uh, support the government over there and the militias and send uh, personnel, etc.? Meaning that have all of us, including the big powers and Europeans, etc., walk in the morning to uh, learn, to hear that Mr. Ortogan has already gone to uh, Libya? I don't think so. I think that Turkey wouldn't have moved this major move without at least a yellow light, or the big powers look the other way to allow him to go and prevent the uh, army, the national army, General Haftar, uh, from prevailing. Which means that the idea, the policy was that keep the situation in Libya as it is. Don't allow this or that side to prevail until we find a way out. That is first step. Second step, are we to, I'm afraid, uh, uh, to 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 uh, that this policy would move towards enabling the current government in Tripoli to prevail in the situation, which means that we go back to the idea of this moderate religious government with police. I lost you. Dogan's decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, was it only Mr. Erdogan's decision? Many people in the Middle East do not believe that. They believe that it is much bigger, much more important intervention and important political move. The, the, the result was, or the goal was, to keep the situation as it is. There is East, there is West. None of them should prevail. Just so that I don't lose you, you're saying it was not Mr. Erdogan's decision alone? Who's that was my question. Okay, well, why don't you answer it? Who are you? Who are you? I, I, I really believe, knowing how things are being done, I don't think that Mr. Erdogan has done all that without even informing big powers that we are going to do this. Which big powers, Amro Musa? Big powers are big powers. They are well known. The, the America, right. Russia, and Europe. Those okay. are the countries involved in this uh, situation. Vitaly now can, uh, so uh, Amro Musa is saying that you're in on this. You know, you're one of the big powers. There Russia. might be in. That was a question of mine. Are you okay. in? Are you in on this? Uh, as Russia? <laughs> and come closer to the camera because you're too far to, to hear you, uh, Vitaly Naukin. Okay. Are you in on this? Is w w did you get in uh, with Erdogan, or are you there to fight Erdogan in Libya? We are not fighting against uh, anyone in Libya. We are, we have uh, relationships with both sides. There, were, there have been a lot of visits from uh, both from the government of uh, Sarraj or from uh, Mr. Haftar, and uh, it doesn't it, it doesn't mean that we're supporting either side in this conflict. We're in favor of uh, the role of United Nations of uh, reconciliation of the peace process. I think that uh, Russia was in particularly uh, in particular satisfied with the plan of Hassan Salami, unfortunately he left and he retired, but I think that uh, his plans uh, were very, so very, very, very good, well done, and uh, 
but I'm very pessimistic about the uh, the lack of motivation from both sides, you know, to stop violence and to come to uh, some compromise. We're in favor of compromises. That's right. it. Okay. Uh, let me, while I have you, Vitaly Nomka, let me uh, take a look at uh, what Russia, uh, since I sit in Beirut, and if I don't ask about Lebanon, I'd be absolutely crucified. So, uh, what does Russia think about uh, what's going on in Lebanon? It's about to collapse, uh, it looks like it's really on the verge of collapse. My understanding is that Russia has left Lebanon to Iran, that Iran is the key of stability in Lebanon and as far as the Kremlin is concerned. Is this really the assessment of uh, uh, Russia, that leave it to Iran because they are stronger and they have Hezbollah here? And that's because stability is something Russia always says, this is what I need, what I want to talk about. Uh, we can remember the very specific uh, personal relationship between our leaders, uh, our leaders' leadership and uh, Mr. Hariri, uh, the uh, Rafiq Hariri and uh, Saad, and uh, there are very spe special relationships between the Sunni community and all other communities. You know, we are not uh, giving up uh, Lebanon as one uh, as a very important partner of Russia in the Middle East. Russia has already supported humanitarily uh, Lebanon in this crisis. We are providing some uh, limited, uh, you know, help uh, to Lebanon. I think what's uh, the economic situation is bad. The political situation is, is bad. But uh, I don't think that we, we have to blame only Iran on that. Okay. So what do you want to blame and what are you going to do about it? Sorry, go, go ahead. Blame whom you want. <laughs> We're not blaming anyone. It's internal crisis, internal crisis, the same as in Iraq. Whom can you blame in Iraq for what's happening there? I am a bit optimistic about uh, Kaldemir's government. You know, probably he can uh, uh, make something in order to improve situation. But the same thing, a deeply divided country, the same about Lebanon, the same about this. But Levan, uh, Lebanon uh, has been surviving through wars and 15 years of uh, civil war and all these conflicts. But uh, let's uh, let them decide uh, themselves, you know, what to do. Let them, let, uh, let us help them humanitarily. Mm, okay, I get you. Uh, Alistair Burt, um, is Lebanon uh, left to uh, wither on its own uh, by itself? Uh, what's, what is the, what's, the, what's the view from the UK and Europe? Uh, is that, what is the way out for Lebanon from the dilemma it's in? Well, I, I, I've been closely involved with so many efforts to support the economy in Lebanon over the years. The, the, the big conferences we held, the CEDRA conference in, in Paris, the uh, initiative we ran in London, and everyone has known the truth for years. The, the economy has been living on fumes for a long time. And uh, what was very interesting, I thought, recently in what emerged on the streets was that young people who have been kept apart by the sectarian nature of politics and the structure of government were rejecting that, were coming together and saying, we've been shortchanged here by our respective governments. Uh, look at the rampant inflation. We can't get money out of the banks. Whoever's to blame, it's not our fault. And we're not going to be told anymore that we can't make changes to the structure of our government by Hezbollah or by one sector or another because we've had enough. Now, then the virus came along and those yeah. protests have been drowned out. Nobody outside Lebanon wants to see Lebanon go to the wall and everyone has worked immensely hard to try and prevent that. But ultimately, the solutions have got to be in the hands of those who are governing in Lebanon, those who aspire to govern. And ultimately, the issue of Hezbollah can't be ducked. And that's got to be, that's got to be tackled. Uh, Bob Howard? Oh, I, uh, I, it, you, go ahead. It, it's a recurring, this, we've seen this play before. We've seen this play over and over. Uh, and so we can't help them more than they can help themselves. Well, what does that um, mean? What does that mean? What, uh, it translate that to for me. Sort out, sort out the corruption. Sort out the corruption uh, and get your economy sorted and stop running to other people. Yeah, and who you run to is important also. Uh, so people want to help. People have shown the potential to help. People have been involved. But at the end of the day, they can't drive the solution. 
So, okay, I get you. So this is a, a, a very big warning to Lebanon. Sort it out, and because the world is not going to come and help you sort it out because it's not in, in the in the card. I got you. Now I've got let's let's see four five four three minutes. Have what three minutes left? Half a minute for each one with a fast message. What do you want uh, to say uh, to leave us with? I'm sorry, it's so fast. It doesn't give us too much time. But why don't we start with you, Bob? Since uh, you have the floor, go ahead. Tell me in thirty in thirty seconds what is your message. Uh, for stability uh, in the region or whatever message you want to give. It's going to take time. We're going to have to see how we come out of these current crises. And, and when we do, then we'll know where we stand. And I would say one other thing, especially on this COVID-19, this issue is going to be with us for another year or two. Until we get a vaccine that can be globally distributed and testing that verifies, we aren't going to know what the future looks like. But when we do, yeah. I think we'll, we'll move forward very aggressively and make up for the lost time we've had. Okay, great. Alistair Bird, 30 seconds. Everybody, 30 seconds. We're just about to die, uh, as they say <laughs> in the language of... 30 seconds, please, Alistair Bird. Um, guard against nationalism. Guard against believing that uh, you can only work out solutions for your own people and the devil take the hindmost. Be prepared to work together, but be prepared to confront now, honestly, the issues that have been affecting uh, the region and globally for too long, and be prepared to take the, the tough measures to resolve things. Otherwise, we will go on with, the, with world politics more or less as it is, but much poorer, with no, people not able to make donations, uh, and with a greater sense of building fortresses around ourselves rather than working together. We should guard against all that. Excellent. Vitaly Nankin. Well, I think that the main thing is to cooperate and to try to mitigate all these uh, divisions, especially the sectarian ones, which are, uh, you know, exploding the situation in the, in the region, also fighting corruption, and uh, thinking about compromises rather than resorting to this old uh, axis of evil approach. Then, uh, quick words, Vitaly, about oil prices and the effect of oil prices on the stability of Russia and the region. And quick word, because you, we really need there, to... There is another tr important triangle, uh, Saudi Arabia, United States, and Russia. Uh, I think probably for the first time we are trying to work together constructively. Also, there are differences, but still I'm very, I'm hopeful that it can work in order to stabilize the oil market. But well, the lack of demand is uh, what, what can you know, harm our economies together. So the American intervention with Saudi Arabia um, sort of helped correct the relationship between Russia and Saudi Arabia on the oil issue? Uh, we, we've, uh, we've made a lot of compromises. We, we, we signed agreement with Saudi Arabia. I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm very optimistic about what can happen, but the re recession is the main enemy of all of us including the United States. Yeah, unfortunately, you're right. Hamra Musa, 30 seconds. I just want to say and to call on all of us to do everything we can to prevent the annexation of the Palestinian territories. We have to stop that. We have to, uh, the friends of Israel have to advise Mr. Netanyahu that this, uh, such a step would be so dangerous to the stability today and tomorrow in the Middle East. It will turn into a so sour a situation uh, in the region, not only the Middle East by the definition, the political definition, but in the Mediterranean, in the Red Sea, and in the whole area around uh, Israel and Palestine. Hold on. Take that to the Kremlin and, uh, and, uh, and please, Alistair, take it to Europe and Bob, do take it to Washington, please. Let me just say thank you to all of you and let me announce the e-policy circle number three. Who will we have? Uh, it's always a great cast. What, what an honor that we have been attracting such amazing personalities uh, and thinkers. So let me announce for next week three out of the four who will be with us. The fourth we will confirm later. We have His Excellency Hoshia Zibari, former Iraqi foreign minister and also minister of- Great. Uh, great man. He was uh, also a former deputy minister in Iraq. 
we have uh, Mr. Walid Jumblat, uh, Lebanese. Uh, okay. <laughs> that you are happy, Amru Musa. Yeah. And, and we have Jeffrey Feltzman, uh, who is, of course, the former Under Secretary General for Political Affairs and former U.S. Ambassador to Lebanon. And uh, Amru Musa, I thank you for being uh, also a member of the board of Beirut Institute. I am ready to pay anything you say to join this <laughs> foursome with Walid <laughs> Jablat, Husha Zubari. Uh, and Jeff and Feldman, it's a pretty since good Since you have a vacant seat, why don't you uh, allow me to get in? No, no, you got your chance. Well, I have to be in the audience. <laughs> I have to be listening in. Yes, I, I'll be in the audience, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. You honor me. You always honor me. I thank you very much. I wish you a great day. Thank, thank you, you Raghida. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Raghida. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well done, guys. Okay. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.